Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Thera Pat Chinchonchuren from Rama Tibdi Hospital. I'm a co-moderator with Dr. Vanen today, and we'd like to welcome you to our session, the breakout session today. Um, and we have three topics. Uh, we're going to start with the assessment of prosthetic valve by um, Dr. Thompson. Um, she's a um, expert um, imaging cardiologist from uh, Alfred um, Hospital Australia. Please welcome. Thank you very much. Um, I've been asked to speak about echo imaging of prosthetic valves. So what do you do when you do an echo um, with a prosthetic valve? Pretty much the same as usual, but there are some differences. So we usually begin with a transthoracic uh, echo. We do 2D to look at structure. We do Doppler to look at hemodynamics and to assess regurgitation. And then in selected cases, we go on to do a transesophageal echo, looking mainly at the structure of the valve. When we do an echo of a prosthesis, there are a number of things that we need to know. If we are armed with knowledge, we can do a much better job. We need to know the product. We need to know the look. We need to know how it should appear and whether or not it's looking normal or not. We need to know about artifacts because they can really mislead us. We need to know about flow, maximal velocities, mean gradients, um, DVIs, and effective orifice areas. And what's normal regurgitation? If we don't know what looks normal, we can't tell if it's abnormal. And we also need to have some knowledge of what problems you can have with a prosthesis. So you can have patient prosthesis mismatch, obstruction, and abnormal regurgitation. So this is the product. You can see on one side of the screen, I've got uh, images of surgical valves. We've got a um, bi-leaflet mechanical valve, a single leaflet tilting disc, a stented um, bioprosthesis and a um, uh, valve conduit. Then we've got the TAVI, the core valve and the Edwards, and we have the surgical hybrid valves. So the Percival, which is D, which is the sutureless aortic valve, and at the bottom is the Intrepid, um, which looks a little bit like a spaceship, um, which is a um, transcatheter mitral valve. So when we do an echocardiogram, we do a structural assessment and the valve design influences the 2D appearance. So this is, um, these two are two bi-leaflet mechanical valves. And here you can see the two leaflets and you can see that they're both moving symmetrically. You can look for the opening and closing angles and you can ascertain whether or not that's normal. And this is in fact um, opening and closing normally. Whereas with this one, there's some hang up of one of the leaflets and this is a patient who's got obstruction. And you need to know um, what is the normal appearance of the valve. Now this is a core valve. This was done at my hospital very early on in our experience. And you can see um, that this valve is projecting well down into the left ventricular outflow tract under the anterior mitral valve leaflet and in these two views, particularly in the second view, which you're looking at from the left ventricle, you can see that the um, cage of the core valve is sitting on top of that anterior leaflet and affecting its opening. So that is not normal. It's impinging on the anterior mitral valve leaflet. So you need to understand how it should look and when it isn't normal. When we do 2D and 3D, there are certain limitations that you do need to be aware of. There are a number of artifacts that can either lead you to overdiagnose or underdiagnose problems. And you can also distort the information depending on your image cut. So if you don't get an appropriate image cut, you might think that the valve leaflets are not opening symmetrically when in fact, if you rotate around, you can see that they are. So um, these images show um, acoustic shadowing and reverberation artifact due to a mitral valve prosthesis. And I'll point out to you that the artifact tends to happen in the far field. So with the transthoracic echo, you can't see what's going on in the left atrium. Whereas with the transesophageal echo, artifact in the far field, again, you can't see what's happening in the ventricle. 
And this is an aortic prosthesis. And again, um, most of the artifact is in the far field. So on transthoracic echo, um, you don't see the posterior part of the annulus very well. Whereas in the transesophageal echo, you don't see the anterior part of the annulus very well. Um, and this is um, also something else you need to be aware of. You need to be careful with your imaging planes. Leaflet movement is best seen if your ultrasound beam is parallel to the leaflets, not orthogonal. So in the first parasternal long axis image, you can't really see the motion of the leaflets at all. Whereas in a five chamber view where you're lined up much better, you can. And this is the point that I was making earlier. You might need to rotate your image to show your leaflet opening better. So in the first image, you really can't see the leaflet opening very well. Whereas once I've rotated to a two chamber, you get a much better idea about leaflet opening. The next thing I want to talk about is hemodynamics. You need to be aware that all normally functioning prostheses cause some obstruction to flow. And you need to be aware of what is normal. Um, when you do do an echocardiogram on a prosthesis, it's very worthwhile knowing what the prosthesis is, what the size of it is, and probably when it was implanted. There are charts that will tell you what's a normal gradient, what's a normal EOA, what's a normal DVI in all of these valves. So it's well worthwhile referring to the charts to work out whether what you have is normal or not. When we do assessment of hemodynamics, a number of our measurements are flow dependent, but some are flow corrected. So a peak velocity and a mean gradient are flow dependent. A DPI and um, an EOA that should read are flow corrected. If you get a high velocity and a high gradient, you might have obstruction, but there are a number of other possible causes that you need to consider. The patient might have a high output state. The patient, um, you might be showing pressure recovery. It might relate to the valve geometry. You might be detecting um, valve, you might be detecting flow through the narrowest orifice of the valve, but that might not be um, representative of the whole valve, or it might be a technical error. So th this is a concept of pressure recovery. The gradients that you measure um, with echo are higher than those measured invasively. This can happen, um, particularly in the setting of an aortic prosthesis, when the aortic root and ascending aorta are small. And it's due to kinetic energy being transformed into thermal energy in the setting of turbulent flow. So you can see here, as the blood flows through the orifice of the valve, um, it will flow at higher velocity. But then as the pressure energy and the kinetic energy gets transformed into thermal energy, um, the, the pressure uh, measured on the other side will drop. And that will lead you to overestimate the pressure gradient What's Doppler velocity index? This is the fingerprint of the valve. This is a very useful um, flow corrected index that we use. Um, and we can measure aortic prosthesis DVI measuring left ventricular outflow tract velocity divided by aortic velocity. And we could also do the same thing with the mitral valve prosthesis by measuring the mitral VTI over the left ventricular outflow tract VTI. Now with the aortic prostheses, um, this automatically um, corrects for flow. If the patient has AR and the gradient is up, the left ventricular outflow tract velocity will also go up. So that ratio um, should not be affected. And with the mitral prosthesis, um, again, you can look at um, the mitral VTI over the left ventricular outflow tract VTI, but it's important that there isn't any AR. So these are the measurements that you require. So it's quite simple. So peak velocities for aortic valve prostheses will allow you to calculate a DVI, and this one's abnormal. With mitral valve prostheses, it's a similar concept, except this time, instead of using velocities, we use VTIs. And we need to get the mitral valve VTI and the left ventricular outflow tract VTI. And again, we can calculate the mitral valve DVI. Now, in this setting, that particular parameter in the context of the mitral valve tells us if the valve is abnormal. 
but it doesn't necessarily tells, uh, tell us whether or not the valve is stenotic or leaking, but it just tells us it's abnormal. EOA, um, effective orifice area, is also um, less flow dependent than velocity and gradients, and it's a better measure of intrinsic flow function, and it's calculated from the continuity equation. And this states basically that whatever flows in must flow out, and this is the formula that we use. And in the setting of um, an aortic prosthesis, these are the measurements we need. We need a left ventricular outflow tract diameter. We need a VTI um, through the outflow tract, and we also need a VTI through the aortic valve, and that will allow us to calculate EOA. With mitral valve prosthesis, it's also pretty similar. Um, we need to have a left ventricular outflow tract, VTI, and also a mitral valve, VTI, um, and, and that will enable us to calculate EOA. How do we interpret um, high prosthetic valve gradients? Uh, well, we can use the EOA. If the valve is obstructed, the EOA will be reduced. In the setting of patient prosthesis mismatch, the EOA is normal because the valve is actually normal. The problem with it is that it's too small for the patient. So we, if we index it, the indexed EOA is reduced. And in all other states, the EOA is normal. Now, the concept of patient prosthesis mismatch, I'm sure you're all familiar with, and it's basically when the valve is too small for the patient, the valve is actually inherently normal. Um, but it's too small to cope with the patient's demands. Um, if the indexed EOA is um, less than 0 0.65, the patient has severe patient prosthesis mismatch, and this correlates with poor outcome. So it's a, a very good idea to detect this, but an even better idea for it not to happen in the first place. Now, if we get high gradients um, this, it, across the aortic valve, we can follow this particular flow chart. So you've got a high gradient across the aortic valve. You need to ask yourself, is your um, EOA normal and is your Doppler velocity index normal? Now, if those things are normal, if the indexed EOA is less than 0 0.85, then the patient has prosthesis mismatch. Otherwise, they either have an, sort of their high output state or there's some error in the measurement. If the EOA and the Doppler velocity index are reduced, then you need to look for leaflet motion. And if there's abnormal leaflet motion, the valve's obstructed. And if there isn't, it might be due to um, pressure recovery or it might be an error. And similarly for the mitral valve, if the EOA and the DVI are normal, then you need to look at the indexed value of the EOA. And if that's reduced, then the patient has patient prosthesis mismatch. Now, if the EOA and the DVI are not normal and the pressure half times prolonged, then the patient has obstruction. If those parameters, if the um, gradients are high and the um, EOA and DPI are not normal, um, but the pressure half times short, then they probably have MR. When you assess aortic regurgitation in the context of a prosthesis, you need to be aware of what's normal flow, what you normally see in the prostheses. So this, is this normal or not? Well, these jets are, but this jet isn't. So this is outside the sewing ring. You can see there's quite a lot of regurgitation and you can see there's a piezoderm. Um, here, we're grading paravalvial AR in the setting of a TAVI. Now, that's quite a difficult thing to do. How much AR is there? And you can see that there seems to be AR from both above and below the valve in this view. And in order to assess this, you need to get a short axis and you need to scan all the way through the, the valve to work out how much there is. And then you need to work it out sort of relative to a clock face. Um, whether or not there's mild, moderate or severe, because assessing paravalvular AR in the setting of a TAVI, particularly in the cath lab, is very difficult. But it's important because if there is AR, the patients do worse, and the more AR they have, the worse they do. And finally, I want to talk briefly about case selection for transesophageal echo. We do it whenever there's prosthetic valve dysfunction. We do it in suspected cases of endocarditis. 
It's particularly helpful in mitral valve prostheses. It's a little less helpful in aortic prostheses, and there should be a very low threshold for complementary imaging with CT or with fluoroscopy. And I'll just briefly show you this case. This is a um, lady who has got a uh, mechanical mitral valve in and she has problems with shortness of breath and anemia. And this is the surface study and you can see it's actually pretty difficult to see what's going on. There is one hint in this view. Now this patient was referred on for a transesophageal echo. Oh sorry, th this is the Doppler across the valve. So you can see short pressure half time and the mitral valve prosthetic um, DVI is increased. So this is the kind of valve where we're worried that there's abnormal regurgitation. So this is our um, transesophageal echo. You can see the normal and the abnormal. And then this is 3D. So this lady, in fact, had had this problem before. It was a lady who'd had a uh, bileaflet mechanical valve put in in the setting of calcified annulus, had had a paravalvular leak before, and someone has popped an amplatzer in, and you can see that it hasn't worked at all. So in conclusion, you need to know your product, you need to know the normal appearance, the normal flow and hemodynamics in order to recognise the abnormal. You need to know the problems that can occur and how to use 2D Doppler and transesophageal echo to recognise these. Thank you. And uh, the next speaker is Dr. Vanden from Atlanta, Uni uh, United States, and he's going to uh, talk about the new era of tricuspid valve imaging. So please welcome Dr. Vanden. How do I move the slides? Thank you. Good morning and thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. This is just a overview of what is going on in the TR world. Um, what am I doing here? Severity of TR. PISA and vena contracta are probably the two most quantitative parameters that we have in daily clinical practice. They are absolutely in daily clinical practice not so helpful. They work when they work, but if you're doing a lot of TR, you understand the limitations of PISA and TR, never been validated, but we still use the same cutoff as we use for MR. We definitely need a better quantitative assessment indices for TR. I'm not sure that is going to come out of color Doppler, but these are the more practical ones, and we still use them, but we understand the limitations of it. 3D PISA EROA, even less validated. We have done a lot of this. We have over hundreds of patients with 3D PISA EROA. We are looking at clinical outcome prediction based on 3D PISA EROA. I am not sure this is necessarily going to solve the problem, but it certainly is better than 2D PISA for tricuspid regurgitation. I still believe that the um, semi-quantitative or indirect parameters are best in 2D echo for assessment of TR. Um, a dilated right ventricle, a dilated right atrium, unexplained by other reasons, is indicative of volume overload. IVC size is a very reliable sign of significant TR, and um, whether or not it collapses a dilated IVC per se in the TR setting tells you there is significant volume overload. We still use the intensity of the Doppler as long as you've aligned it well as a good semi-quantitative index of severity of TR. Can you not, uh, I can't talk over your talking. Probably the most specific sign of TR in Doppler, not to be underestimated, is the flow reversal shown by those white arrows, systolic flow reversal. Um, which is uh, very specific for severe tricuspid regurgitation. RV function in TR remains a challenge. We'll talk about this in the next session, but RV strain 
to me, is perhaps a good way of telling whether or not there is significant volume overload on that right ventricle as opposed to the conventional factors. The problem here is RV strain is even less standardized than LV strain, so it is very lab specific and technique specific, but it is, in my book, a good parameter for assessment of right ventricular contraction in volume overload situations. The DPDT from TR is actually a very good index if, um, if it can be done well. Um, the DPDT, um, as is shown here, is the time taken from one meter per second to three, uh, two meters per second. And you can see here the DPDT is abnormal. The normal is about 400, and uh, it is about 200 something here. And then you can also normalize it to the volume overload by dividing it by the peak TR velocity that normalizes to the TR or the volume, and that should usually be in the range of 160. Here it is 80, which is clearly abnormal. A, a load independent measure of RV contractility together with strain, I believe these are the two indices that indicate occult RV dysfunction in volume overload. CT is becoming an important way of assessing TR, especially for patients you're selecting for intervention. Um, there are two major applications for CT. One is to look at RV morphology, not so much contraction, but to look at the distance between the annulus to the apex of the RV, which is very important if you're putting in prosthesis, transcatheter prosthesis. The distance between the annulus to the tip of the papillary muscles are important. All of this play an important role in selecting patients for transcatheter tricuspid intervention. Another big role for CT is the assessment of annulus size. Echo, even 3D echo, is often not enough to assess the annulus sizing, especially to understand what prosthesis size you need to pick if you're doing transcatheter replacement, which I'll show you a case, or if you're doing annuloplasty, transcatheter, and you want to assess the change in the annular size. Um, CT still is the best way to do it. Contrast CT is essential for it. You can see how it is done. It's a projected area or a perimeter that we use for tricuspid annulus. Um, if you don't have contrast CT, 3D echo is often useful in place of contrast CT. Um, here is how we do it. This is real-time volume color Doppler of the tricuspid valve, and from which you can automatically model the tricuspid annulus, just as we do for mitral, um, using the same algorithm, and you can get 3D area and 3D perimeter. These numbers are comparable to CT, except they are smaller than CT numbers uh, by a proportion, and if we can understand what that proportion is, we can size the tricuspid prosthesis or even look for changes pre and post intervention. And here are some slides to comparative numbers in the same patient between 3D, TE, and CT. You can see those numbers are smaller compared to CT. CT is the source for 3D printing for planning procedures, especially if you're doing annular procedures or transcatheter tricuspid valve replacement. Um, CT is also very helpful to understand the tissue integrity of the tricuspid annulus. You use the same Hounsfield units that you use for calcium, and you look at the strength of or the tissue integrity of the annulus. These are important when you're doing transcatheter annuloplasty techniques because you don't want to have a pull through of any of the plications that you do transcatheter or coils and other uh, materials that you may employ for annuloplasty techniques. We have done this and we have shown that that is important in uh, preventing complications during transcatheter. This is how we do it. You can actually look at the gradation of uh, the strength or the integrity of the annulus all the way from its insertion around the 360 degrees using CT. So CT is a valuable way of doing it. Not validated, but very useful. 3D printing is best done by CT, not so much by 3D echo, um, because it does more black-white interface than you would want. It is very helpful for annulus, as is shown here. You can see there are markers where we are going to put pledges during an annuloplasty. CT, a 3D echo does not give us enough um, black-white interface to get reliable printing of the annulus. Um, neither technique provide enough 
um, resolution to have leaflets printed, but there is less concern about planning uh, leaflet uh, techniques with uh, 3D printing. The right coronary location relative to the uh, annulus is very important, and that is best done by CT. It, uh, CT is essential for this, and you want this to be at least five millimeters away from the uh, anterior annulus so that you don't uh, snare the right coronary artery during your annuloplasty techniques. So CT has become an integral part of assessment of patients with tricuspid regurgitation, especially if you're doing transcatheter procedures. A few examples of the transcatheter procedures that can be done for TR now, tricuspid clip is being done. Um, one of the big changes in tricuspid clip is TEE, is a 2D TEE is not necessarily the best technique in terms of identifying leaflet grasping during tricuspid clip, we have entirely switched over to 2D eyes for leaflet grasping. As is shown an example here, you can do color Doppler with ice, intracardiac echo. You can see the nice resolution of the tricuspid leaflet. And on the fluoroscopy there, you can see the anatomy and the, the arrow is pointing to where the ice catheter is in the right atrium. Here is the clip. Um, you can, uh, this is a pacemaker wire, and you can see this is a TR due to pacemaker wire. It's impinging on the, on the anterior leaflet. You can see it is between the anterior leaflet and the septal leaflet, and there is, in fact, a flail segment of the septal leaflet, which is shown on the still picture at the bottom. So this is tricuspid regurgitation location is ideal for clipping. You want it to be in the anteroseptal uh, region. You don't want it to be in the postroseptal region, which is a much more difficult region to grasp in terms of its current uh, iteration of the guide system, although that is now changed for TR-specific guide system, or um, and that may be even better. Here is the um, ice picture showing leaflet grasping. Um, this is much superior to 2D TEE for understanding whether the leaflets are inserted into the clip and for understanding what happens to the TR jet during the tightening of the clip. Uh, we do this routinely now, and we, we do TEEs because TEEs are still, the 3D portion of the TEE is essential to understand the location of the clips, but in terms of grasping, we do it, switch over to ICE, and our hope is that ICE would become an exclusive way of doing things so that you don't have to sedate these patients with general anesthesia. Maybe conscious sedation would do during clip procedures. Um, not in everybody, but at least in a selection uh, in a selected patients. Here is a second clip in the same patient. So the uh, advantage of intracardiac echo is that it does not have artifacts even when you already have a clip in place. With TE, oftentimes it's very difficult to understand if you're grasping the clip or you're grasping the leaflets in another location. Intracardiac echo has good resolution, especially the 2D ice catheters. And here you can see the two clips. The first clip has a slightly more motion than we would want. The second clip seems to be in good location. And you can see also the ice catheter in the right atrium. And these are the two clips in position now. And you can see the TR, residual TR, one, um, both of them uh, in the anteroseptal region. And this is pre and post. Um, you can see on the left side is the TR with a large PISA in the anteroseptal region, and that's entirely gone now. So significant reduction in TR. It's very unlikely that you're going to see zero TR on the tricuspid regurgitation uh, clip technique. Another way to deal with TR is to do a direct annuloplasty transcatheter. There is a, uh, there is a system called the Tricinch device. We have done a few of those patients, um, and this is how we do it. We use the 3D TEE to guide the system to its an uh, anterior location. You can see it is at about the 1 o'clock location, which is what you want. You can see the leaflet anatomy. Um, and then you, on the 2D echo, you see the system is placed over the insertion of the anterior annulus. Then we deliver um, a coil uh, into the pericardial space on the surface of the heart near the anterior annulus. You, we insufflate the pericardial space with CO2 so that you separate out the pericardial layers. You can see the CO2 as, a, um, as that um, in the pericardial space in fluoroscopy. And you can see we pierce the myocardium and uh, it appears on the surface of the heart in the pericardial space. We deliver a coil 
um, right there, and then we cinch that coil through the delivery system, and you can see the TR on the left uh, at baseline and TR after cinching the annulus with the coil outside the heart in the pericardial space, a significant reduction. You can see this in real time. So here, TEE is sufficient to the most part, although intracardiac echo has some role during this procedure. And you can see the change in annulus pre and post. You can do this on the fly on the platform now. You can do a baseline assessment of the perimeter and area, and you can see how both the shape and the area and perimeter have changed during tricuspid annuloplasty. It's not moving. Oh. Let me go back here. So the last um, approach to TR is a transcatheter tricuspid valve replacement. Um, here you see, um, I don't know why these movies are not playing. Oh, there they play. This is a patient who had a tricuspid ring and a mitral ring um, many years ago, now has 78 year old, now has severe TR and right sided heart failure. And you can see severe TR with the tricuspid ring at baseline on 2D echo. And on 3D echo, you can see the tricuspid ring, um, and uh, we are going to do a transcatheter tricuspid valve. So it's a valve and ring. This is an intrepid valve that we use for TMVR. It's the same valve that we put in on the right side. This is the first case ever done with intrepid on the right side. And um, fluoroscopy is essential for this. It's very difficult to see the valve with the ring in place when you, even with 3D or 2D, and fluoroscopy remains a good way of looking at the valve during the implant. This thing is not moving. Where should I point this thing? Here, here. Can you move this slide for me? We're almost there, just a couple of slides. And go to the next slide, please. Good. Just hold that. You can see the TR on 3D echo right there. Go to the next slide, please. I won't mess this around. And here, here is a set of fluoro. You can see the intrepid valve. I can't point with this, I guess. You can see the intrepid valve through the ring. Here is the tricuspid ring. And you can see the intrepid valve being positioned for solely guided by fluoro for the most part. Here is the valve being deployed. You can see the valve is deployed now in the tricuspid position. Next slide, please. And this is post-implant. Uh, you can see the intrepid in position with minimal TVL, transvalvular leak, no PVL. And so this is a solution that is emerging, at least in some patients. And here the, the RV size becomes important because this prosthesis occupies much of the RV. So it is very important to do a good CT planning for RV morphology. And that's why CT is integral in tricuspid regurgitation patients. Um, next slide, please. And this is post-implant 3D echo. You can see the valve right here. This is the ring the tricuspid surgical ring that was there previously, and no TR compared to what was in the baseline. I think that is the last slide. Forward, please. Forward. Good. Keep going. I don't think these show anything different. Are you going backwards or forwards? Forward. No, no, forward, forward. Is that the end? 
Okay, well, that is the end then. Thank you. So in the next 15 minutes, I'm going to share uh, you about the when and how to do um, strain imaging. My name is Jerry Pat uh, from Brahmatipity Hospital. So as you know that our heart contracts in a three-dimensional way, so we not only have longitudinal motions, we have torsion and we have so, um, the radial strain. So with the new technologies that we can track the motion of the speckles, so we know how, uh, how well the heart is contracting in longitudinal way, and we also have the um, machine to calculate the numbers, and we get the radio, and we have the um, circumferential strains. But the longitudinal strain is one of the most um, clinical relevant parameters nowadays in part due to the good inter-observer and intra-observer variabilities, while the radial and circumferential strain is not so popular. Back in 1961, there were tissue Doppler analysis of the heart motion. However, these techniques um, are not so well validated because uh, the tissue Doppler has a limitation about angle dependent and because the peak of the strain is so difficult to identify and therefore there are uh, several intra-observer and intra-observer variabilities. Um, this is a formula to calculate the strain. So if you know the length at the time of the heart contract and you minus to the, um, the length, the initial length, and you divide it into uh, by the initial length, you get the um, longitudinal strain. So normally the number is going to be um, in the minus number. This is a recent review by Patrick Collier back in 2007 about the um, usefulness of speckle tracking. Um, the clinical application is um, mainly in the undifferentiated left ventricular hypertrophy, assessment of cardiotoxicity, aortic stenosis, ischemic heart disease, regional strain, or other chambers like left atrial and right ventricular strain. However, there are some sources of variability like image quality, clip selection, the contouring, tracking, choice of segmentation model, and choice of vendors. And also the clinical sources of variability, including race, age, gender, hemodynamics, especially blood pressure, medication, and volume status. For example, um, if we see left ventricular hypertrophy, normally we think of horse, not the zebra, but sometimes we see zebra um, in our clinical practice. Uh, according to one of the largest registry in patients with severe calcific aortic stenosis undergoing TAVR, um, it has found that, um, especially in patients with low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis, up to about 16% had um, transteratine uh, cardiac amyloidosis, especially in male patients. It's about 22% of the male patients. And we know that um, transteratine amyloidosis now had treatment. Um, even though we don't have trifamidis in our country, but we also had like um, um, simple NSAIDs and other medication to slow down the transteratine. Uh, my colleagues back in the Cleveland Clinic, Dr. Dermot Phelan, published this article back in 2012 about using the um, apical sparing patterns to identify different types of um, left ventricular hypertrophy. And what he found that in the upper panel here from A1 to A4, there is specific um, patterns that call apical sparing patterns that finally identify as cardiac amyloidosis. Why Holcomb seems to have the drop in strain, especially in the septal level, and aortic stenosis or other cardiomyopathies, we have the random patterns of um, dropping in strain. Um, the definition of apical sparing pattern is that when you have the exaggerated absolute apical basal strain difference. So normally we can have 
apical to basal strain difference about minus two percent. But in the case of cardiac amyloidosis, the average of this difference is around eight uh, percent. To calculate the relative apical sparing index, you need average apical longitudinal strain divided by average basal longitudinal strain plus average mid longitudinal strain. If this index is over than one, it has very good um, power to differentiate um, the um, amyloidosis from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or aortic stenosis. And comparing with C statistics with the ROC curve, the relative longitudinal strain has more differentiated power when comparing to deceleration time or E to E prime or ejection fraction. And this is a classic example. This is one of our case that we verified it with the endomyocardial biopsy, and we found that it is uh, cardiac amyloidosis. And you can see that this pattern has the epical sparing when you have quite uh, relatively red. And if you calculate it, apical strain is minus 86. And if you divide it by the summation, the mid and basal strain, this index is more than 1. This relative apical um, longitudinal strain ratio turned out to be 1.59. And it looks like um, cherry on top on the um, cupcake. So we call it as a cherry on top size. Also, the strain pattern can can be useful in identifying specific patterns of diseases like Yamaguchi or the apical HCM, which is quite prevalent in Asian populations. And we found that there is a drop in the strain at the apical part. And while sarcoidosis mainly involves the septum, and constrictions mainly involve the infralateral wall, and amyloidosis mainly involve the apex, which is apical sparing patterns. Another um, usefulness of this imaging is to use it for the chemotherapy patients. And as uh, mentioned in the guidelines uh, from Dr. Planner back in 2014 about using the strain imaging as a um, um, surveillance tool for patients who are uh, on chemotherapy, uh, it has been mentioned up here that uh, you, you need baseline evaluation of ejection fraction, and if you can do uh, global longitudinal strain, that would be preferred. Uh, to detect the subclinical LV dysfunction, um, if you have a drop in the strain um, more than 15%, that is the definition of subclinical LV dysfunction. But if you have the drop of ejection fraction more than 10 units or 10 points to the number lower than 53, that is a clear definition of cardiotoxicity or chemotherapy-related cardiac uh, um, dysfunction. The interesting thing is that there is a recent randomized trial to use lisinopril versus carvedilol to prevent patients who are on trastuzumab. And in that study, in the patient who has combined trastuzumab and anthracycline exposure, <clears throat> there is a clear evidence that carvedilol or lisinopril can prevent the outcome of the cardiotoxicity. So that means that if you can detect it earlier at the stage, you probably can prevent the outcome. And in Thailand, we have lots of trouble because this patient mostly has combined trastuzumab and anthracycline. And most of the time, the patient present late and they also had radiation. So we probably see this problem more frequently than the Western world. Our group <clears throat> at the Cleveland Clinic looking at the strain imaging and in the patient who had asymptomatic aortic stenosis <clears throat> with normal ejection fraction. So um, we would like to predict the outcome of the patient who has no symptoms and preserve ejection fraction. And we put the aortic valve calcification, the peak aortic valve gradient, valvular arterial impedance, and global longitudinal strain to predict death and AVR, uh, as well as the STS score. And we found that the additional of global longitudinal strain on top of valvular arterial impedance plus severe calcification, peak AV gradient, and STS score has the most predictive values, and that's incremented to the prior model. 
and at the number of absolute strain um, of the 15 is a good cutoff to identify whether the patient is going to have better survival or not in this setting. And also, uh, our group um, had the RV strain imaging for the patient who's undergoing LVAD, and that is a good predictor as well um, as a pre-evaluation of the RV function for LVAD transplant, as well as the um, prediction of pulmonary hypertension patients who may have RV dysfunction at the very early stage. And, um, the uh, RV strain has been shown to be useful. However, there are limitations of RV strain because it's not well validated, and some centers use just the segmental three, three segments of the lateral wall, or some patient, some centers use the average of the six segments model. So the next part, which is the second part of the talk, is how do I obtain the RV strain? So first of all, we need to acquire and select appropriate image. And you assess the adequacy of strain um, measurements. You detect and you mark the reference landmark, which, is, which are the annulus and the apex. Then you trace the endocardial border, and you adjust the region of interest to avoid pericardium. And then you evaluate the tracking quality, and you repeat the steps again one more time. The rule of thumb for the frame rate is about 0.8 times of the heart rate, and normally the 50 frames per second is usually acceptable at risk. Or if you have uh, exercise, you probably need more high, uh, a higher heart rate, uh, frame rate. You should avoid um, doing strain in atrial fibrillations, but if you do, you should increase the clip from three to five beats and acquire the view in the similar RR interval. The common pitfall is that the mitral annulus, when you should mark the mitral annulus at the insertion of the mitral leaflets, if you mark it too low, the strain is going to be underestimated. Another part is antral septum. You should trace the antral septum <clears throat> not to include aortic root. Otherwise, you're going to create the lower strain or in uh, the, uh, the septal bulge that I'm going to mention it uh, further. For apical tracing, you should avoid your pericardium because pericardium doesn't move. And if you include pericardium, your strain number is going to be uh, abnormally um, lower. Uh, for the region of interest, you should put the apex at the, um, the point where you can trace the myocardium moving, not too far and not um, too low into the, um, uh, the, the cavity. The difficult part is when the f geometry of the alvey is not um, so clear. Um, for example, um, if you have a thin myocardium in some part, or the thick myocardium, you cannot represent the whole of the myocardium. So this is a limitation that um, there are no clear uh, positional guidelines, but this is just another example that how we trace the myocardium in the setting of the unequal thickness. Um, for the septal bulge, uh, our ROI should not follow the bulging shape. So you don't go this way, but you just go in the middle and then um, keep the average number. Another um, mistake is that you take the hypertrophy papillary muscle as a part of the wall, and then you get the uh, um, abnormal uh, strain at this point. But actually, it is a papillary muscle that looks thick. So in conclusion, this is my take home message for practical guide for strain obtain, uh, to obtain the strain. So first, record the optimal possible quality image and watch the wall motion very carefully before tracing. Be cautious where you put the region of interest, especially in the annulus and apex. Pay attention to the ROI width and avoid confusion with anatomic structure, especially papillary muscle or trabeculation. And with that, thank you very much for your attention. Um, with the um, 
you, you put an intrepid through um, a ring on the right side. Yeah. Do you feel that um, without the ring, it would be impossible to do it because the annulus would usually be so big? And, you know, you'd have to have such a big device. That's all. Is it going to be limited on the right side? Because it was a brilliant result. Right. So that's why we did this as a first case, because the current intrepid sizes won't be sufficient in a dilated tricuspid annulus. So they are working on a larger device on the right side. That won't be available for at least a couple of years. But you're quite right. You need, a, you need something on the annulus right now to put a valve in there, because especially big annulus, we don't have an intrepid of that size. You're right. <laughs> Can I ask you a question? Is that okay? I, or somebody wants to ask a question at the back. I mean, I don't want to, if you all have any questions, feel free to ask. So you can come up here and I'll, oh, you have a microphone there. So, um, I have a problem with this apical sparing, uh -huh. right? I have, this is what happens in the echo world. We like phenomenology a lot. I, I, so let me ask you, because it came out of, and I have good friends. By the way, um, Dinesh was my fellow. I trained him, and I have been asking him this question nonstop for the last three years, and nobody seems to give me a, a straight answer. Um, why, and I think your last three slides were more important than all the first 10 slides. And the reason I say that is, it is so important to understand that strain is very variable. It's not like, it's not that easy. As, uh, you know, you move those region of interest a little bit, you get a different number, right? right? So I think your last three slides is absolutely critical for people wanting to do strain. But have you seen apical sparing in every patient of amyloid no. that you have dealt with? No. Um, I think it's like all the tests have their own sensitivity, specificity, and especially with this technique, it's so operator dependent. So um, at the time that I first learned, I, I trained with Dr. Marwick, and he let me do 100 normal strain. Uh, at the Cleveland Clinic, we use the VVI machines. Yes, of course. And with we, that, we, we yeah. have the curve, and he looked at every single curve and then uh, we need to train our hands and our eyes of tracking until the QC is a quality control uh, was approved and uh, I have to keep my way of tracking it and then producing the images by my way and then keep doing that but even though uh, with that uh, we still have seen lots of patients that have both um, far positive and false negative. We have seen apical sparing patterns in another um, uh, diseases, but also even though the patient has real amyloid and that uh, we didn't see it. I think there are multiple reasons to explain and most of the time it's about the operative dependent. And another thing is about the um, the variation of the uh, transferatin, especially transferatin amyloid that can deficit more. And we know that comparing uh, with the AL amyloid, transferatin has less apical sparing patterns. That probably be another reason. And one other thing is that patients may have combined disease. When they get older, they may have ischemic heart disease that may cause some scar in the LV. And even though they have combined diseases, they may not have typical patterns that, that was shown in the classic paper. Do you have any questions, Aurapan? Yeah. Or? Well, the some uh, vendors, they have uh, endo, mid, and, uh, and uh, the ex external. So what lately I think they would like us to do with the middle Middle, sec, middle line or for the ROI. That's what the recommendation nowadays or? But even that line in the middle, you move it a little bit, yeah. <laughs> you get a different number. Right. So all the standardization that's been done with strain, I think enormously under place that real world changes in strain that we get. I mean, you have trained in a good center where there is some attention to quality 
and being critical of the number that you're getting. But I can tell you, in the US, I am deeply worried about strain. It's Everybody shows the bullseye, never shows where it came from, right? The bullseye always looks beautiful. But we all know transthoracic echo. It cannot be that beautiful. And when you look at the two chamber, the apex is outside the sector. And yet, the bullseye looks perfect. And if you look at the tracking, it is tracking a black space outside the sector. How is that even possible, right? So there is no critical analysis. That's my, my little concern about strain is everybody thinks it's a magic solution to a lot of things. Not you, because I think you understand it. You under, you're critical about your data, but I worry about strain a little bit. What's the feeling for the auto strain that the Tom Tech just come out for past? It's the same problem. If you've seen auto strain, as soon as it appears, people move it a little bit. Yes, they do. Every auto strain is edited a little bit. In other words, I don't think auto strain, auto strain is just a good way of getting it more convenient, but people still move those lines and the number is different. I, so. I think the big issue with that is if you're going to do things like alt chemotherapy in a patient with breast cancer based on a decline in strain, you do want to be very confident it's real. That is my biggest concern. Even in our own center, we have been so critical about our data. Uh, I certainly feel like we should not be stopping a therapy that is uh, of a life-threatening disease based on a number that we don't know fully is absolutely correct, especially in a normal-looking ventricle with normal EF. If the strain is decreased, which is the patient we are talking about, right? I, I think we need another way of internal validation of that number before you jump up and say, don't do this thing or whatever. And I think there are steps to do it, um, but I think it needs to come out. We are writing one for Jace now, how not to do strain. So, um, because I worry about this epidemic of GLS. And it's, um, it's um, I mean, at least the EF, if I show you a four chamber and I say, what is the EF? We all have an idea. Right? I mean, if I measure it and it's 30%, but your eye is telling you it's 55 or 60%, clearly you question it. With GLS, there is no way of telling whether that number is right or wrong. There is absolute, actually there is a way to do it, but we don't do it. That's a problem. And I think that internal validation is important. Anyway, so uh, any other questions? I don't want to monopolize the conversation. Uh, any question from the floor? Question? Anybody? No. Now, okay. I have a question for the your tricuspid intervention. Yes. Now you go with ice. So do you combine ice and TE? We want to get rid of the TE if we can because there's a big push in not, not wanting to give general anesthesia to these patients. Um, the problem is ice cannot look at certain steps. We've done even mitroclips purely with ice. So we've tried a few cases. It has worked. But the problem is, if a tricuspid clip, um, the clip delivery system initially goes into the SVC, and then you pull it back and you turn it towards the tricuspid valve. That manipulation is hard to see on intracardiac echo because you're too close to the structures. You're in the RA mm -hmm. and you're too close. Whereas TE is a little away and you can actually see the SVC, et cetera. To see the full length of the SVC and the, the manipulation of the CDS towards the tricuspid valve, is the key step that I'm worried about not being seen on ice. We've not given up hope, but if that works, I think at least a third of our patients can be done with ice, without TE. So no uh, general anesthesia, just conscious sedation, just like Tavers now, they get conscious sedation and go home the next day. So that's our hope. I don't know if they will get there. Have you tried just transthoracic echo for that part of the the procedure. That's a thought we have had. Uh, our guys are a little, you know, it's very messy to do a transthoracic echo when they've draped up the patient and all that stuff. But we want to try it. Um, we want to try it. We want to see. That's a good thought, though, Helen. I mean, I think that's a good way to, go, a good approach. You ever try the pediatric TE? Without sedation, you mean? Yeah. Just conscious sedation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we could Would try that. Help? I don't know. I have been thinking, but I haven't. Do you, I, I, I don't know whether you see the tricuspid valve. Is there a good contact to see the valve? I don't know. I have not done that. I, I don't know. That, yeah. I'm, I'm going to try. <laughs> yeah, you should try. And I think you may be able. I mean, if that works, that may be another way to do it. There's an intranasal one. 
Um, I wonder if that works. I don't know. Well, whatever we can do not to give general anesthesia to these patients, it'll be very helpful. Ice is terrific for grasping. The key step is grasping the leaflets. So I think ice is just absolutely exquisite. We cannot do without ice. Okay. I think uh, we are done with the session. Is that right? Yep. Okay, well, great. Good session. Thank you. It's hard. It's hard. It's so very, this is very good. No, no, ice is a good way to go. Your life becomes better. No, no, that is very good. We do the March clips. I'm sure yeah. we plan on doing it, but I can tell you this. I think that's great. Mm. Yeah. 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 Yeah.